anyway, welcome. We're kind of back. <laughs> And I thought things would look a lot better by now, and of course they don't look that much better. Um, but we will continue on. Um, I will kind of take the blame. We are not streaming on our Facebook page this morning, and um, that was because I couldn't find anybody, and, and uh, that's all a whole lot more difficult than it seems like it ought to be sometime. Uh, but it is being recorded for view on cable beyond the uh, city. We thank the city for, we did, Greg and I just discussed some 10 years of recording our meetings and we really appreciate that. Uh, so thanks to the city for that and to Julia and so forth. Um, So anyway, we, uh, we have a policy breakfast again today. We have one next uh, in December, December 17th, and we have one January 28th. And I may mention those at the beginning. Um, at some point in time, actually about 10 years ago, I'm looking at my uh, notes here, the University of Illinois Springfield, the United Way of Central Illinois, and the Community Foundation for the Land of Lincoln collaborated for citizen surveys starting in two, uh, 2013, 15, 17, 19, and the current one, uh, 2021. Uh, that really is our program today. The, uh, the surveys were designed to assess changes in residents' assessment of life in Sangamon County. We have Dr. A.J. Simmons, who will do, discuss the, the data. Uh, A.J. is the a lot of light up here today, uh, is the Research Director, Institute for Legal, Legislative, and Policy Studies uh, at the University of Illinois. Thank you. Uh, and Springfield. We will start with a presentation on the study, and then we have a panel that we'll discuss uh, after uh, AJ's presentation. Dr. Simmons. I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes or so. If you know me, you know that's actually quite the feat. So uh, normally I'll go much longer. But I'm going to try and keep to 15 minutes today to talk about some of the results. Now the survey is kind of all-encompassing, and there are more results than we can go over today. But we've got a report on the Institute's website. We have a longer recording as well than what I'll be going over today. So if there's something we didn't talk about up here and you want to know more, look to the report or look to the other uh, presentation. Uh, so with that, let me make sure my little clicker works here. <laughs> Does it work? Uh, of course. Oh, no, there we go. Oh, we're not. <laughs> I'll just say when I move to the next slide, how about that? <laughs> we can make that work. All right, let's go on to the next slide then. All right, so I want to start off by thanking the United Way of Central Illinois, the Community Foundation for the Land of Lincoln, and UIS for the financial and resource support in allowing this study to be completed. I also want to talk a little bit about uh, the approach to data collection that we've done. Uh, so like similar years, we, uh, the past few years, we sent out a package. Oh, no, you want to stay on that for a slide, actually? You're fine, like settle as you know. Um, so like previous years, we sent out a, a package in the mail. The package had a letter explaining the study, it had a paper copy of the survey, and it had a prepaid envelope that folks could send back to us. Folks could take the survey either by filling it out on paper, put it in the mail, or taking it online. Uh, we sent it to about 10,000 households uh, in the county and ended up getting about 726 surveys by uh, the deadline. We had some come in after the deadline, and uh, some that you know folks refused or didn't you know nobody was at the address that sort of stuff, but that's to be expected. So 726 surveys uh, were completed by the deadline. Uh, consistent with previous years, our margin of error is about four percent, so plus or minus. So keep that in mind on each of the questions. And consistent with previous years, uh, the results were weighed to reflect county demographics as well. If you want to go ahead and move to the next slide. So the the first question uh, that we want to start talking about today is. 
based off the question that asks if residents and respondents think that the county's heading in the right direction or it's off on the right track. This is a pretty standard question that we've asked in this survey that are asked at the state level, national level, so on and so forth. And you know, this year, and to folks, about 50% said things are heading in the right direction here, which is fairly consistent with the prior year. Um, and then, so we brought in some comparison sake, right? Because f some folks see 50% and they go, oh my gosh, that's 50% is low. Let's look at the state. Let's look at the national. For the comparisons that we can bring into the state, the state hasn't crossed 25% um, since we started fielding this uh, survey in 2013. And at the national level, it's usually in between 30 and 40%. 40% is like on the high end of the national level of folks saying things are heading in the right direction in America. So in comparison, 50% is actually a really good uh, amount of folks saying things are heading in the right direction here. And one of the things that may be related to how people assess uh, the direction of things in the county is confidence and leadership. So if you can move to the next slide, please. Back in 2013, when we first started the survey, we asked folks um, about their, if they were confident in local unelected officials and local elected leaders. And then in 2017, we added state and federal as well. We can see you know, pretty consistently over the years, local unelected leaders are the, the highest uh, level of folks having confidence in them at roughly two thirds. And then we have local elected leadership at, again, right around 50%. And then state and elected um, this year around a third. And we can see with um, state and federal that there's been a, a bit of an, especially state, a bit of an increase, a bit of an increase, a bit of an increase each year. Uh, I wish we had asked this in 2015 prior to uh, the budget issues here to kind of have a comparison to understand maybe what the impact of that on things here was. Uh, but we don't have that. But what we can say is, again, that local unelected leaders are consistently viewed as having the highest level of confidence in them amongst the public. If I can get, go to the next slide, please. So one of the questions that kind of caught a lot of folks' attention last year was this question around, have you considered moving out of the county? You know, we've asked this since 2015 and had pretty consistent results in 2015 and 2017, and then we see this big jump in 2019, right? And that made people nervous. <laughs> um, but considering moving kind of means a lot of stuff, right? You now, you, are you watching what, Buying Hawaii or one of those show Buying Key West in the middle of winter thinking, you know what, Florida sounds great right now while I'm sitting in a snowstorm here? Or is there something else going on? So, you know, we see a consistent result in 2021 from 2019. And then in 2021, to try and understand that, we dove a little deeper and asked some additional questions. If you want to move to the next slide? Whoa, that looks very different <laughs> than it should. OK, um, that's fine. So one of the things that we asked folks is if they thought that they would move out of the county in the next year. Now, a little over a quarter of folks, 27%, said um, that they think that within a year that they'll move out of the area. Now, we're talking about a quarter of that 58%, which is roughly 15% of uh, the actual respondents. Um, and we know from existing research when it comes to m moving that about half the people that think they're going to move in the near future actually do. So we're looking closer to somewhere around 7 8% of folks that have a higher likelihood of moving in the next year. And it sounds, again, like a lot, but that's actually within the normal range. Within a, in a given year, anywhere from about 4 to 8% of an area of a county moves out of that county. So we're on the high end of that, but still within a normal range. Uh, and we also asked folks um, where they're considering moving. Are they looking at somewhere else here in Illinois? Are they looking at a different state or both? And the largest group there is of folks that are looking to leave Illinois entirely at 59%. Then a little over a third have said they've considered leaving Illinois and considered just moving to another county. And then only 7% have said they've considered only moving to another county here. Uh, when you kind of combine those together, then we're looking at of the people that have said they've considered moving, 93% have looked out of the state. 41% have looked within the state. To give some kind of insight uh, on where folks are moving. <clears throat> I'm going to take a drink of water real quick, sorry. <laughs> If you can move to the next slide, please. So 
considering moving again that I kind of mentioned can mean a lot of things. And we want to understand well, what have people done as a part of those considerations. And we ask people, you know, at, you can see the options up there. Looked at jobs, applied for jobs, uh, told friends and family they were moving, looked at cost of living, looked at cost of moving, looked at housing, applied for housing. And we see that looking at the uh, cost of living and looking at housing are the two highest groups. And that applying for a job and applying for housing are the two lowest. So applying for housing and applying for a job are kind of more serious steps, right, in a move, right? Like you are actively pursuing leaving. And those are the two lowest groups um, that we see on there. And so again, as we start kind of peeling back the layers on that consideration question, that, so we start off at 58%, that sounds alarming. And we keep moving through things and we see that it's actually a much smaller number than that initial 58% suggests. Um, if we want to uh, move on to the, the next slide, please. So we also asked folks about why they're considering moving. And the largest groups uh, of respondents are those that say state and local taxes and politics. Um, when we look at surveys of why people move, those factors are actually relatively low on the list. Uh, we tend to see that people move for jobs in particular, family, cost of living, crime and safety, um, weather uh, are things that drive it. And so we may be capturing kind of more just general discontent than actual motivations for moving there. So it's something I'd like to see us kind of dive more into to understand, like, is it really politics? And I'd also be curious about kind of a, a regional effect or something, right? We're talking about Sangamon County here right in the middle of the state. Now, if you're in Adams County and you're upset about those things, it's a little bit easier to move across the river, right? So I'm curious about those effects a, uh, a little bit. <clears throat> But yeah, when we kind of look beyond the, the politics and taxes stuff, we see things like cost of living and crime, um, you know, cultural and entertainment, those sort of things, which again are more in line with what we see from folks that actually move. If I can get, move to the next slide, please. So a new area that we've added um, is one of the things that's impacting why we're all wearing masks in here, right? COVID. To try and understand attitudes towards COVID in the local area. And one of the things that we've asked about is folks' concern about the fiscal impact on a couple different sectors here in the area. Local businesses, the community, uh, local nonprofits, friends and family, government, state government, the household, and the employer. And we see that 87% of respondents um, report being concerned about the fiscal impact of COVID on local businesses. And that's, um, you know, a high level, right? And it also actually aligns with some other um, research that's out there talking about local businesses, talking with local business owners, that 82% of them are concerned about the fiscal impact of COVID on their local business. Um, and then we asked uh, some additional questions about uh, COVID that I'm going to move on to. So if you can move to the next slide, please. So Bob was talking about life getting back to normal, right? That, gosh, that slide looks weird. Does that look, that does not look the same on the PowerPoint? That's all right, though. Um, so we asked folks when they thought they were, their life was going to get back to normal, and we used Labor Day as kind of the cutoff for the purpose of our analysis. Nearly two-thirds of respondents thought that we have li our lives back to normal, our day-to-day -day life back to normal by Labor Day. Uh, we're all still in masks. We're not back to normal yet. Um, but we also asked about behavioral changes around COVID, some different um, Changes the way we change our lives a lot, right? And so we asked folks about um, their willingness to support local businesses and prior to COVID to now, and we find that nearly two, no, three fourths of uh, respondents says they're more likely to support or shop at a local business now than compared to COVID. We find just under half of respondents say that they're shopping online more than prior to COVID. And we find that just over half of respondents are getting food to go as opposed to sitting in a restaurant more than prior to COVID. Next slide, please. So related to talking about local businesses and then behaviors of consumers and stuff, we ask questions about the local economy. Now, this is a question that we have asked since the survey started in 2013. Uh, we asked if, uh, compared to last year, how have business, con business conditions in the, the area stacked up. And we see you know, this year 52% of respondents say that business conditions are worse now than they were a year ago. And I don't think that's entirely a surprise 
given the pandemic. It is, the, it, is a, it is a large jump from 2019, but not as large as the jump that we saw from 2015 to 2017 during the budget crisis. Um, and then we see kind of fairly consistent results for the question around improved, right? It doesn't bounce around a ton. It seems more of the actions around worsened or stay the same. Next slide, please. Uh, to kind of grow in understanding attitudes and perceptions of the local businesses, uh, we added a question in 2019 that asked folks to rate the economy currently in, in Sangamon County. You know, in 2019, 27 percent rated the economy as either good or excellent, and in 2021, it's down to 21 percent. Move on to the next slide, please. This year, we added a question about the future. What are folks' expectations a year from now? And we see that 40% of respondents say that the local business conditions will be better off a year from now than they are today. Another 45 uh, say that they'll be about the same. And to build on this even further, we started to ask questions also about personal finances. If you can move to the next slide, please. So we asked folks a similar question about the, their personal finances as we did the local economy. If their finances are better off, worse off, or about the same uh, than 12 months ago. And we see that 17% say worse off, 58% say better, or say about the same, and about 25% say worse off. Uh, so there's some interesting demographics changes, um, differences I should say, that I think are worth kind of noting here. 78% of respondents with at least a uh, four-year degree, oh, sorry, that's the next slide. <laughs> I apologize, I'm jumping around my notes here. Sorry, uh, back up if you don't mind. Sorry, I jumped ahead of myself, I apologize. Um, so 34% of respondents with at least a four-year degree say that their finances are better off compared to 17% of those with a high school degree or less. 33% uh, of respondents under the age of 35 report their personal finances is better off compared to 18% of those 55 or older. And then, as we saw a preview there, if you want to move to the next slide, uh, we asked folks to rate their finances uh, today. And we see that 57% uh, rate their finances as good, as good or excellent, another 29% at fair, and 15% at poor. 78% of respondents with at least a four-year degree rate their personal finances as good or excellent, double the 39% of those with a high school diploma or less. 85% of those surveyed uh, who report an annual household income of greater than 100000 a year report their finances as good or excellent compared to 22% of those uh, reporting 30000 a year or less. So we do see some fiscal, some differences in evaluations around that. Can you go on to the next slide, please? And we ask folks, again, to be prospective, look into the future. And we see that 40% of folks say that their uh, household income is going to be better off in a year, 52% say about the same, 8% say worse off. And we see some demographic variations here that's worth noting. 68% of respondents under 35 report their personal finances will be better in a year compared to 21% of those 55 and older. 36% of those surveyed who report an annual household income of greater than 100,000 report their personal finances will be better, the lowest of the four income groups. For the sake of time, I'm going to wrap up with just one more topic and then hand it off to our wonderful panel. If you can move to the next slide, please. So this slide here lo looks at a survey question we've asked since 2013 about physical and mental health. We asked folks, you know, how many days have you had a bad physical health day and a mental health day? This comes from a CDC survey that's done uh, across all 50 states. So we ask a similar question here. And we see that after a bit of a drop from 2013 to 2015, that physical health's largely been fairly consistent, right? When you consider the margin of error, it's staying right there around 40% 40, uh, 40 or so. The bigger thing that jumps out is the mental health question, right? In 2013, 18% said that they had at least one bad mental health day in the past 30 days. Similar rate in 2015, a big spike in 2017, continuing to go up in 2019, and another big jump here in 2021. It's been a long 18 months for folks, right? And this is not the only data showing that we're having some mental health issues in our society. This is a pretty consistent finding across different studies is that there are some mental health issues that come from uh, the pandemic. And that's you know, happening at the national level, that's happening at the local level. That's something to kind of keep in mind. I'd like to, to dive more into this in the future, I think. I think this is an area that we could better understand even further. 
And so um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to do something with that more in the future to understand, like, what does that mean? What does that look like exactly for our community? Uh, and if you can move to the last slide, please. Uh, one of the last things I want to note is that we're talking perceptions here as well, right? You know, we have that question about supporting local businesses more. That's the perception. That's the intention of people. I think there's ways that we could go about trying to look at, is that actually happening? We have people saying, you know, over half are saying that they're getting their food to go more or not. There's a way we could talk to local restaurants to see if that's the trend. I've talked to some, and that does seem to be the case for them, but, you know, is that reality for everybody or is that just perception? And another thing I want to talk about is that this is the same in county citizen survey. This is a folks that live here, right? So when we ask questions about moving out, one of the things we also have to keep in mind is that folks are moving in as well, right? Um, Sangamon County has a, had a little bit of a population decline, but not nearly as bad as other counties in the state. And in fact, according to Bloomberg, we've actually seen a slight population increase during the pandemic. Uh, we also have a Business Insider article, right, where <laughs> Sangamon County has been cited as the top place to move to post-pandemic, right? So, so folks are... Um, here and they have opinions, but folks are moving here as well. I think that could be an interesting thing to understand is like, why, why do folks when they come to Springfield, uh, Sangamon County, choose this area? So keep in mind that we're talking perceptions and that we're talking perceptions of folks that are here and that there are other perceptions that could be really important too of like folks looking at Sangamon County, looking to move here. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to the wonderful panel uh, to get their, their insights on these things and happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Simmons. We'll move into a uh, kind of a panel discussion. Uh, these are kind of the three principal players, you might say. Um, some 10 years uh, or so ago, uh, through, a, through really the Citizens Club, this collaborative effort uh, came about. And, uh, and we've been very, very pleased with, with the outcome. Our panel consists of Dr. Molly J. Lamb. Dr. Lamb is the Executive Director, Center for State Policy and Leadership, University of Illinois Springfield. Mr. John Gelker, President, CEO, United Way of Springfield, or of Central Illinois. And John Strimsterfer, President and CEO of the Community Foundation for the Land of Lincoln. Uh, I'm going to ask them to really, from their perspective, react on, uh, on the survey. They can ask AJ any questions if they'd like. Uh, and, uh, uh, and, and just uh, discuss the impact and, and to a degree, to a large degree, I hope, why these things are important. And we'll start with Molly. Good morning. Thanks for having all of us this morning. I, I do see a couple of our esteemed steering committee members that aren't with us here today, so I just wanted to start and say thank you to our steering committee that joined us in the drafting of this. Um, Dr. Bunch is in the audience today. Polly Poskin's in the audience. Uh, we had Dr. David Stewart with us, um, Tiffany Mathis. Uh, let's see. And that's it, I think. So we're, uh, you know, it took the team to have this next draft made for us to be where we are today. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, this is my first um, Sangamon Citizens County survey. I joined the University of Illinois Springfield in June of 2020, although I've been a citizen of Sangamon County since 2003. So it was important for me to be able to be a part of this survey and, and really trying to understand the, un, the reactions and the perceptions and attitudes and behaviors of the, res, of the respondents in Sangamon County and the perception around some of these key areas around community, quality of life, equity, economy, COVID, and leadership. I think one of my main reactions, actually, is that while there are some concerns, you know, one in particular around the pandemic, exasperating perhaps the mental health that AJ just ended his results on, there aren't any huge surprises necessarily across the survey or any areas of which the results show that we need 100% focus here in the Sangamon County to make better. I also believe that there have been some actions in past histories that have, that we've utilized this data to create change in the community. So I look to John Strimps for a lot and say, you know, in 2019 when the move out question spiked, 
uh, I know that that spurred thinking and action to even get to even accomplish the, the next 10 project of which, um, he, which John's leading as a part of the Community Foundation. I also believe that there's opportunity here when we see the results, such as the mental health, when we look at a community health assessment and community health improvement plan, where mental health has been seen as a priority in counties. It's a, it's a priority across the state in the state health improvement plan. And you'll hear from those folks next month and as a part of this agenda. And I think it's important to take a look at the plans and the actions that are already happening in the community and gain better understanding of some of the areas um, of which the data shows us to be able to incorporate and collectively together um, walk forward. Uh, I, think, um, I think it's also important to understand how we can work together um, and it takes leadership and synergies across the, across the system and across the levels and across organizations and understanding the, the perception of those citizens of which we serve in the public and who they trust in the community to make change and to, and to go for it and that's important and then to try to understand how we we, how, how can we change that? What do we need to do to change and increase the trust in, in elected officials here locally um, and along with working with those that have greater influence uh, such as non-elected officials in the, in the community? I think it's also important, uh, you know, as a public health practitioner, uh, it's been important. COVID response has been very important um, for many reasons, and it's um, in particular it's important for us to think about how COVID's impacted every citizen in the county, and not just think about. I think people are so quick to get back to normalcy and not understanding there's some really great lessons and applications that we can learn from this COVID response to even make improvements and make better. So. When AJ's speaking about the business economy and the, and the citizens wanting and desiring to have pickup and have curbside pickup, more outdoor, more outdoor seating. I mean, there's some really um, good um, um, outcomes that came during, during the pandemic that we should think about encouraging and continuing on um, versus just a, a reaction of going right back to the way we were before COVID. And I think, I think people are just so eager to get through this that that's a very quick way to, to return. But I think we should not lose sight that there are some really great lessons that we need to continue to apply and, and move forward. And so I think those are probably my top three kind of reaction just in general for, for the survey for this past year in 2021. Very good. Thank you. We'll move to John Gelker. Thank you. Um, and I also want to begin with, with some thanks. Thanks to AJ and his team and the uh, individuals out at the university that are helping us. If I had three takeaways, one of them Molly mentioned um, is how well non-elected leaders are received in the community. And when I think of that, I think of the Citizens Club. I think of our business sector, our health sector, our nonprofit sector, and it tells me um, those are the, while I want it to be our elected officials that move us forward, if the confidence and the perception is that it's others that they feel better about, it's incumbent on us to do take those first steps. So um, one, I applaud the Citizens Club for, for being so supportive of the survey through the years. And we are we should be a voice. Um, I realize numbers are down a bit this morning because of COVID. But again, I think the Citizens Club, and I'm a member of the ABC Club, and I'm a member of Rotary in town, civic clubs can make a difference. And I think those are the ones that are identified. Um, the other that I think was a very positive, and I was trying to find the exact stats, but respondents who would say a positive word about Sangamon County is high in every category. Gender, race, education, income, parent or non-parent, and whether those are living here more or less than 10 years, you'll see some pieces that we break out. That's a message we should share because I think we're inundated with some negative stigmatisms about Sangamon County. But in fact, these respondents are saying across the board, they would share a positive comment. And then the last one that maybe I'll turn it into a question, I don't know that AJ will have a specific answer, but if you look across everything, those who have a higher education, greater income, greater health outcomes, 
greater perception of almost every issue we ask about. And I know education is important to United Way. I know it's important to our community foundation. We can't stress enough, and I appreciate that we stop for a moment to recognize the issues that happened at Landfear. We can't work hard enough to ensure our young people are getting the education and the opportunities that we have. So. It's probably, from a professor's, professor's perspective, it's going to say it's natural. But in fact, it, it just cried out to me, looking back over 10 years of study, how much education is implicated throughout. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. John? Thanks, Bob. Um, kind of ditto to Mao and John in their <laughs> comments. It's always nice to go last. Um, but I also want to share my thanks to the Citizens Club and to UIS for another um, wonderful survey out in our community. This is a decade now that we've been at this. I also want to say a special thanks to John Kelker, who shared this stage with me for every two years for a decade now. And this may be the last time, because as many of you know, he's announced his retirement. We did not ask a survey question about that. <laughs> but I think the citizens would be disappointed. Um, j just a couple observations from the report this time. I, I think this time, more than any other survey we put out there, there were forces beyond our control locally that affected the results of our local survey. We all know what's going on with COVID-19. I think when you especially look at um, the trends on mental health, I forget about the last year or the last day, how many of us have had a, a tough day. Uh, just worried about our children, especially senior citizens who are affected by this with the potential of mortality. It's, it's a scary time in the world. And we're certainly not immune to that here in Sangamon County. Also, on some of the survey questions of trust in police, I think I, I don't know if that's necessarily a local issue or just the aftermath of the killing of George Floyd in Minnesota. I, I think those societal forces that affect our citizens as well may be some of the reasons we're seeing some of those trends we um, are a bit concerned about. And I hope that can change soon on kind of more of those broader societal fronts. And th then the other thought. Um, and I'm glad AJ mentioned this at the, his concluding remarks. This is a perception survey. So it's just kind of how people are feeling, which I, I think is an important thing to do. Um, I also believe in data and the facts of the matter. I think that's uh, something we look at all the time in analyzing programs that we fund at the Community Foundation. And just, I'm uh, like probably everyone on this stage, a bit of a, a data geek. I, I want to know what's the reality here? What can we do to improve? But the perception does actually matter to me. Um, and that's where I, I was so alarmed two years ago with that, the one we keep talking about, people who considered moving away. Now, I, I love the fact AJ looked deeper into that. Did they actually look uh, to move? That, that does matter to some extent. But I think that's kind of the um, oh, canary in the coal mine. That worried us at the Community Foundation when we saw it jump by 20%. It only jumped by 1% this time. But it's still not going the right way. Um, that, that's what really, I would say more than anything, as we as an organization looked at how we can deploy our mission in the community to, to change things for the positive, was the driving force. Uh, that worry that people are like, they're so upset, they at least thought they want to move away. Um, whether they're actually doing it or not, who knows if they will. Uh, I, I talk big some days, too, and don't, don't follow through. But that's a concern. And, and I, I think it's, again, though, I think it could have gone down if not for these other societal factors as well. So if not for the fear we all have in our lives, this kind of um, uh, constant threat, this existential threat we felt uh, with COVID, I hope that would have been better. We, we won't know. But I hope two years from now we can see that trend start to go in a downward uh, direction where we're back at least in the 30 range of people who uh, don't think about moving away. Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to ask very specific questions, but let me observe two or three things over the years, and then, then we'll just try to get a round table here a little bit. Uh, one of the things on the 2019, which related, was uh, the rather high figure, over 70 percent, of people saying if, if, you, had, if you were going to recommend the young people stay or leave, it was leave overwhelmingly. And so we didn't ask that question, I don't think, this time. Uh, but certainly the, uh, the idea of moving 
uh, r directly relates to it, I think. Um, the uh, the other thing I'd like to just reinforce what uh, what John said, uh, uh, Gelker said, on the elected uh, the non-elected uh, leadership, um, because the the uh, support for local elected was about 49 percent for state elected to state position and elected to federal position was down at about 34 percent and those are all higher than they were two years ago by the way not a lot but a, but a little bit uh, I, and so if you recall we we brought in the ceo of gallup uh, a few uh, a few years ago and uh, and we had a book reading the uh, the book basically made a major point that it wasn't elected officials who are going to do the innovation and the imagination and really getting much done. It was the non-elected community leadership uh, that needs to be the catalyst for those kind of things. And that's as clear today as, as ever. And, uh, and I think everybody should, uh, should keep that in mind. Um, and, and you see it in large degree. Uh, you rarely see an elected official at, at our meetings. Um, I think our meetings are as good as anybody runs in a, from a policy standpoint uh, and have for several years. Certainly topics of the day, you might say. Uh, so there's a lot of things that, that uh, fit, fit into that. I want to uh, mention one and then turn it back over to the panel. Uh, over the years, we've asked uh, questions on uh, uh, is Springfield a good place to live, raise children, so on and so forth. That's always up in the 65, 70, 75 percent deal. And then we always threw in, is it a good place to retire? Mm -hmm. And th that was always about 30 or 35 percent and I never could figure that out number one a whole lot of people asking this or answering are retirees the other point is I don't think Springfield leadership or anything takes advantage of it Springfield is actually a pretty good place to retire there clearly are a lot of retired people in Springfield and so and then while we don't have the numbers I would suggest they make up a big part of the economy of, of, uh, of Springfield. So that, that always puzzled me, let's, let's put it that way, and uh, so forth. If I'm let's, remembering correctly, yes, AJ, um, would you? retired folks actually were higher on that. So people that were actually living here and retired were more positive, and okay. it seems to be folks that weren't. If I'm remembering uh -huh. back to 2019 data, I, mean, yeah. I think that's right, though, yeah. that with retired folks, um, who experience being retired here are more positive in their evaluation of retirement here. It's younger folks that haven't had that opportunity that appear more negative. So maybe once they get into it, they see that Springfield mm -hmm. and the Sangamon County area is a better place to retire than they expected. Except maybe Key West. <laughs> or Arizona, where I'm from. <laughs> OK. Uh, let's just get back into a little bit of, of a round table with the three of you just just jump back in, in any order uh, to to talk a little bit about this, perhaps where we're going, and uh, and particularly uh, if you have a feel for it, how how is this data being used in the community, either by your organization or how would you see it being used by other uh, and so forth. John, you want to, Mr. would you start with it? Well, I, I really am curious to see what the next survey says because um, in spite of some of the feelings about government elected officials, we required government to enter into our lives over the last couple of years in a way we've never experienced, at least I haven't in my lifetime. And we look to the federal government to kind of set a tone and policy, you know, with the fast track of vaccinations and then local public health, uh, I mean, who really thought about public health institutions in their daily lives like we have the last couple of years. And in spite of all the critiques, all the politics of over masking vaccination, I think they've done a heck of a job. 
that PPP program, I've thought about that recently. That was remarkable, <laughs> what Congress did. I, and they kind of held it together. I don't know about you all. We were very fearful uh, a year and a half ago in March. The United Way and Community Foundation really joined arms to uh, create a COVID response fund because not-for-profits had no idea how this would affect giving. The stock market went in half in like a few days. It was a really frightening time. So as much as we all critique our elected officials, that PPP program is pretty good. <laughs> it helped us. It helped up almost every business I know in Springfield. Um, and I think the public health officials have really stepped up. And weren't maybe as prepared as we wanted to be, but you know, nobody has crystal balls. It's, it's, uh, it's very, um, it'll be interesting to see what the history books say about this. So um, I don't know if that was any of the, your prime priming the pump questions here, Bob, but to me at least, um, I think the government did a pretty good job here. Uh, it, it, it wasn't, we didn't fall apart as a society. There were times when I was worried. Uh, it's been a crazy year, but um, we have held it together. I, I see a way forward. I am greatly optimistic for the Springfield area in the near term. There are major public projects that are happening that I think will buoy our spirits and say we can do things. And, and in the light of the horrible tragedy at Lanford High School this year, um, I, I applaud our, our citizens for voting for that um, sales tax increase to improve all the schools in Sangamon County recently. These are positive signs, the rail relocation, the, the transportation hub, the capital complex being renovated. There's exciting, exciting things with UIS, on, I think, on the horizon with the health system. I, I am very optimistic. Um, and I'll close on this, the, the, the next 10 again was our effort as an organization to kind of reflect on thoughts in the community, things going on, and try to harness the, that in a specific direction to tackle some big projects. So we're, we're um, excited to have some things already happening, and I think um, there will be many more positive announcements in regard to the next 10 projects here in the coming months. Very good. Any more comments before we go to questions, Polly? Sure, I'll just, uh, you know, it's important to me, um, representing UIS this morning, that we have a really great gem in our community with the University of Illinois Springfield. And we have so much opportunity in partnership and relationships and in educational opportunities and professional, continuing professional education workshops, use of location for partner type of events and summits, that we need to ensure that we are working together as a community so we can tap those gems, tap UIS in a way that can really help um, the community. You know, I, I'm looking at the, a barrier of um, non or not four years of education as a part of the survey. We stand ready. You know, how can we help? What academic programs do we need to look at to bring into the University of Illinois Springfield to help what is needed here in Springfield? We have other data sources that help us know by way of industry sector, business sector, other that we need to look at for academic programs or certification programs, accelerated type of, of, um, of academic uh, education in order to help those that are juggling profession, professional lives, children. You know, I, I think AJ could remind us, but you know, there was a, there was a, quite of a barrier in the mid-age range, if you look at age as a demographic. So um, th those that are um, between like 18 and 34, I believe, um, of, of a barrier in career success. So how can we help those that are in their mid-career be able to have the quality of life and saying, in county and also achieve their career success. So I think it's important. And then from, um, rep, you know, as executive director of the Center of State Policy and Leadership, the center serves as a way to really help and serve the public to help you be more informed as a citizen. And that's, we're really passionate about that. And we do it in multiple ways, education and journalism through NPR Illinois. We do that through applied research and evidence like we're doing here today with Dr. Simmons. We do that through applied evidence-based practice and, uh, and policy change, and we do that through leadership and professional development programs. So I'm excited and, you know, my early, I'm still fresh and new in, in my role, but I'm excited to really help in the community and be here uh -oh, with my colleagues here to help and see how UIS can really serve in a better way for the community going forward. We have exciting projects. I think John mentioned one around our 2B Innovation Hub, Innovate Springfield, already has been 
downtown presence has made huge headway in the community with its business incubator and inclusion of social innovation that helps really helps target the vulnerable populations to help bring them up. Um, and, and we have opportunity with public policy research and workforce development too in, in our 2B innovation hub and, and district as I think some in the community desire and want and we can do it together. So I think, you know, in, in comments to last and close out, I, th I just wanted to ensure that I made sure that you knew um, the, every citizen in Sangamon County that we UIS are here and we want to help and we want to work with you going forward. Thank you, John. A um, couple of thoughts real quick. I would add to what John Stremstifer shared about elected officials, and my thoughts and prayers go out to all of our school board members, whether it's local or across the country, that dealt with unprecedented decisions and pushback from their citizens. Um, my thoughts go out to all of our school board members. In terms of looking forward, I'd love to see more people get involved in terms of the leadership and support of this. I think it gives more ownership to a company or a group that puts money on the table and brings people to our, our uh, steering committee. And the other, and I don't know if we can do it when it's talking perceptions, but I wonder if the survey could lead us to things that are more actionable. Mm -hmm. Because I'm not sure how well we use it now, but in, in the future, could we, we be asking about things that in turn our community can take action on? Well, I Good. think, if I may, just real quickly, I think it's important for us. We've had discussions, and our goal is to bring a steering kit of many back together to relook at. We've had 10 years of, um, or, you know, every other year, but survey data and trend analysis and look at how we can administer differently. You know, we had a good response rate compared to other surveys and projects in alike and like communities, but we could do better. Uh, we sent to 10,000 households and had 726 responses, for example, you know, for this survey. So how can we um, administer it differently to increase the response? Um, and, and so we're looking to pull the steering committee back together and kind of have an executive report that um, we as a steering committee sitting on the balcony can provide recommendations and um, opportunities for action to community leaders along with an advanced research agenda that will allow us on areas here that the survey falls short to really provide us the why um, answers to, to work towards that. So I think that's important to note as we go forward. Very good. We'll go to the audience and we have a roving microphone and uh, very good. We'll start right here. But Jim will bring up the mic. Oh, I'm Hi. sorry. Start back there. You're so on. I have, what? Um, so I, I have several questions. First of all, how was, I don't want to compare Sangamon County to other counties, other states, whatever. We need to compare Sangamon County to Sangamon County with 10 years, five sets of surveys. Um, first question, some of them are longer response, some of them are shorter response. 726 responses, how is that compared to previous? Um, I have not been able to look through the responses. How, what percentage of those people were retired? So is the survey, are the survey answers skewed to one demographic versus another? Um, so that's that's a couple of real quick questions, um, and then um, John Kelker actually alluded to this about great. We've got this data. How does this help us move forward? How does this make changes? Um, another comment <laughs> question I have is, I take issue with um, the statement, and I'm sorry about this, but we elect people to be our leaders. We should not be having to lean on those people who are heading up nonprofits or um, um, education-related places or businesses as our leadership, we need to be able to depend upon our elected leaders to be leaders. That's what they're called. So I think that that is a, an interesting um, perception of people in Sangamon County, um, the non-elected versus the elected leaders. Um, and then I had another question about um, the people who said that they were going to be moving out, you know, the 58%, was that broken down by age, income, race? I don't think it was. I think that's very important information that we need to have. Um, 
And I think I'll just stop there. Sorry. Um, <laughs> I'll take uh, three of those. So first, the survey is weighted to uh, county demographics, so it is representative of the county. Second, this is the second largest amount of folks that we've had take the survey. I think it's been down to almost 500 before, so the fact that we are at in the sevens is good. Any more on public opinion surveys with probability samples, you're looking at five to eight percent, and we had about seven and a half percent, roughly, um, response rate. Uh, and as for demographic breakouts on questions, that's all in the report that is in over there and online. We break out by gender, age, income, uh, race, um, tenure in the community, uh, parent, non-parent, I think. Uh, I'm trying to remember everything. AJ, that we break it correct me if I'm wrong, but you can like run cross tabs and all that to dig in on like 32-year-old yeah. minorities or whatever. Depends you, on the, the, yeah, the group right. that we have, right? Like I want mm -hmm. we have to have like a reasonable group to be able to make comparisons if we're comparing five yeah. people to four people. That's not exactly helpful. So, but yeah, it is representative of the demographics of the county. It is broken out by demographics, and this is just under um, the most we've ever had. I think previously we had like 740 responses, and now it's 726. Question. I'm interested in how the high schoolers feel about mm. are they going to move away? And why are they going to move away? I was in a calculus class yesterday as a substitute teacher, and uh, a professor from Lincoln Land talked about staying here. Um, why would you want to move away? Because we have A, B, C, D, and E at UIS and Lincoln Land. You know, my kids wanted to leave just because they wanted to get out of the house. So there's that. But also, are we pulling these kids to stay or to come back? To, I'd love to hear about the high schoolers' opinion. I'll jump in real quick. One of the things that we've seen, I think, in the last eight years, and we've had presentations here about the Sangamon CEO program, we are creating opportunities for young people who want to start businesses. They now have relationships, and we hope that's one of the reasons. They may go away for an education, but many people, when you ask a 16 or 17 year old, where would you raise your family? They're not thinking that yet. Mm -hmm. But we hope they'll come back and, and those who are starting businesses will, we hope they'll put a footprint here. Yeah. I just wanted to rise to thank John for his comment about non-governmental leadership and its importance. I don't think we can stress that too much. I mean, over and over for municipalities, not just around here, but around the country, it takes non-governmental leaders to bring about change more than the government leaders themselves. So, so I'm, I support what you're saying, John, and I'd like to see more of it. Uh, related to the cross tabs, I, uh, some of you know, I've always found those some of the most interesting parts of the survey. I noticed in table two, we've got the weighted samples based upon the 2019 estimates, but I didn't see a table anymore that actually provided the raw numbers because that would give us a clue as to what error range are for individual cells not the study as a whole. Are those available even on the time lived here and retirees numbers? Um, so that, since the data is weighted, the data is going to be based off of the weighted sample, right? I understand that, but you say you've got X number in each cell. Uh -huh. You know the actual number mm -hmm. that responded in that cell. And then you have the, the weighted number that you developed. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm interested in the original number, mm -hmm. not the weighted. No, yeah, we have that person. information yeah. that we can make. I didn't see it in the reporting, where that's what no. I'm asking. No, that's not a problem. We have that. Super. Next question. Thank you. Um, I really appreciate this dialogue about the unelected community leaders. Um, and John Kelker specifically mentioned healthcare, and I'm with Memorial Health. Um, and so one thing I want to point out when looking at this is the disparity in that perception for um, white residents versus non-white residents. And there's only about 45% of non-white residents that express that confidence level as compared to 67% of non-white. Um, so I'm interested in, you know, myself included and all of us who consider ourselves leaders and part of these leadership groups and clubs, what are we doing, what more can we be doing to make sure that our leadership is inclusive of um, people who do not look like us? Um, so I'm, I'm interested if you guys have any thoughts on that disparity and what we can do to do better. 
how about wrap up one minute, respond to her and wrap up one minute each by the three panelists. I, I would also like to, you know, give my thanks to John Kelker for so many things in his career here. I feel like that we could have this be longer, maybe a whole session about John's career. But the United Way really, uh, and we've partnered with United Way and others to have a building board diversity effort just for the not-for-profit sector, just for that very point, Becky. I think it's important, but I think in every sector and every organization, I, I, I am excited to see the kind of groundswell movement in our community and across the country to really focus more on diversity, equity, inclusion issues. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's really important. I, I think to your question, though, it depends on the circumstance and the organization and the effort, but having it more to heighten awareness for everyone I think is important. But that building board diversity just for not-for-profit boards is something that I think is really important for our community to focus on. I, I think I saw Katrina sitting maybe right next to you who's really really in the charge for the United Way on that. But um, that's one effort that I'm, uh, the community foundation is very involved with. Good. John took 30 seconds of yours, but would you go ahead, Polly? Sure. I'll, um, I, I agree with you, Becky. I think that's really important for all of us in, in leadership roles now to ensure that we're looking through that lens and incorporating DEI efforts and all that we're doing. Um, so, you know, from the center's perspective and with the mission of really tying to the community and everyday um, citizen, we've activated several DEI work groups across the center, one really connected to NPR to ensure that that we are looking through that lens and um, connected to public media, of which you listen to, that ensuring that we have done that. We've also um, really excited to have a new um, faculty appointment to the center who has a concentration around social equity, so we're excited to have him as a part of and connected to our projects and our work that we do. So those are just immediate actions that we've taken, but it, you're right, it's um, it's all of us in leadership now to ensure that we're, that we're tackling and we're embracing and we're looking through that that lens and then doing actionable and ensuring that we're representative of what we're talking about too, right? So um, thanks for bringing that up and we'll continue to work through and as a community together on that. John, and we hope you're staying in Springfield, but anyway, but. My wife, Lou Ann, and I, we are staying in Springfield. Um, my quick response, Becky, we can do better. As members of the Citizens Club and guests that are here today, use this to start conversations with your friends. Um, use some of the information just within your circles in each of those areas we can do better. So um, I hate, I would hate to see these sit on a shelf when it's, it's really to give us inspiration and begin to change our perceptions. So I want to give a, I don't know what the time is, I don't have a clock, but mm -hmm. a shout out to Bob. The Citizens Club has been very helpful in making sure we get this information out every year. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very good. We will wrap this up then. Thank you to our wonderful panel. Great presentation by Dr. Simmons. <clears throat> uh, December 17th, back here. The, pres the uh, program will be the Sangamon County Health Assessment. This is another collaborative effort between Memorial St. John's and the Sangamon County Department of Public Health. We've done that over the years also. And uh, these collaborative efforts are very, very important to the community. And, uh, and they're kind of late blooming. I, I realize this is 10 years and, and so forth, but in the scheme of things, these didn't happen for a long, long time. On January 28th, to kind of kick off the new year, which I hope will be much better than the last two, we will have the Honorable Mayor Langfelder and the Honorable County Chair Van Meter. Thank you for joining us this morning.